Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this month's operations-oriented uh, Google Hangout. Uh, today, I'm Bill Gustin, captain with Miami-Dade Fire Department. Been there 37 years and five years in the Chicago area. Uh, we also have uh, Mike Dugan from the FDNY, retired ladder 123. Uh, my bald-headed brother from the D.C. area, that would be uh, Battalion Chief Dan Shaw. And my brother from a different mother from the Las Vegas area on the Clark County Fire Department, that would be Clark Lamping, Captain Clark Lamping, and the boss, Bobby Halton. Uh, I want to remind everybody, and I want to thank Key Fire Hose for uh, sponsoring these Google Hangouts. Uh, that would be keyfire.com. Uh, I use Key Fire Hose on my apparatus, and uh, it's a hearty and easy endorsement for me. Uh, I encourage you, that if you're looking for another line of fire hose, contact keyfire.com, get some sample hose from the vendor, try it out against what you have now and some competitive brands, check it for flow, check it for durability, and I challenge you to try to kink it because it is almost impossible to kink that hose. Now, we're going to do some short introductions, uh, but before that, I just want to talk about what, what the topic is going to be today. Uh, our primary topic is going to be what we brought back from FDIC. And what I mean by we is experienced veterans. We've got a lot of experience here, but our thirst for knowledge and our need to learn and continue to be continuing education, our continuing education, and to be lifelong fire service uh, students never stops. So we are as anxious and as interested in attending FDIC as anybody else. So also, for those of you that did not attend FDIC this year, please don't tune us out. FDIC, FDIC.com, Fire Engineering, is very good about archiving uh, presentations at FDIC that you can avail yourself to by going to FDIC.com. That would be www.FDIC.com. They do two webcasts filmed at FDIC per month. Uh, and they're always at the same time, 1400 uh, Central Time, 1500 um, Eastern Time, and for those of you that are not military time oriented, that would be 2 o'clock Central and 3 o'clock Eastern. Uh, the first uh, FDIC webcast will be May the 28th from my brother, a good friend, Greg Havel, Construction Concerns. He writes regularly on the uh, Fire Engineering Web for Construction Concerns a very qualified man, um, a great fire officer, and a very experienced man in the construction industry. Uh, we will always, they'll always be at the same time as I said. On June 4th will be the second one of the year, and that will be the Good Chief Lasky, Good Chief Salka, Good Chief Halton, issues and challenges uh, of the fire service. And uh, okay, we're going to go ahead and run through uh, some just some real quick introductions. We'll start there off on the left there with our good friend, uh, Chief Bobby Halton. Hi, I'm Bobby Halton, and I work for Penwell Fire Group, uh, Fire Rescue Magazine, Fire Engineering, and Fire Apparatus and Emergency Equipment, and FDIC. And then our brother there immediately to the right, uh, Clark. Morning, everybody. It's morning for me. It's still 10 o'clock in the morning on the West Coast. I'm Clark County Fire Department, Engine 11, Truck 11, Rescue 11. I'm taking a temporary assignment in the training division, so I'm the captain of training for about a year, 18 months. I'm really excited. And uh, if you guys are ever in Las Vegas, please look me up. I'd love to buy all the brothers up here. Okay, and then my bald headed brother to your immediate right there. That would be uh, Dan. Hello, Dan. Okay, well, let, let's let's move on to Jason Hovelman from America's Heartland. Jason, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? All right, my brother. Thanks for joining us. Looks like we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty. And how about you, Mike Dugan from FDNY? Yep, I'm here, Billy. Thanks uh, for joining us today. We're uh, going to be talking about FDIC and the things we uh, learned at FDIC this year. Um, this year at FDIC, staying um, into it as a veteran fire officer, and I think we on today. You know, Mike, um, when I was a young 
cocky firefighter. Um, it's amazing. It, ignorance is truly bliss. And when you don't know how much you don't know, uh, it's, it's, it's comforting. Uh, but when you reach a certain stage in your career, uh, you find out how much you really don't know. And uh, my learning curve, especially with um, fire dynamics, modern fire behavior, and um, building construction, uh, is almost like a totally vertical learning curve at this point. And, of course, there's no better place to learn these things than by going to um, uh, FDIC. Now, um, but I always have to go back to the old regulars. I am a huge fan of John Norman, Chief John Norman. And the man reinvents himself, it seems like it's every year. Uh, I attended his four-hour workshop on um, uh, taxpayers and commercial buildings. And his hour and three-quarter workshop on apartment buildings, multiple dwellings. And uh, if any of you have never had a chance to sit in the presence of Chief uh, John Norman, it is a, um, it's a great experience. And he is, if not the leading uh, authority and firefighting in this country, but uh, if he's not the leading, he's one of one of the leading authorities in in, um, in the fire service. Uh, I also had an opportunity to sit on a couple of classes on these wood frame monsters that we talked about a few uh, a couple of months ago uh, from a fellow from um, Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, Stuart Grant from um, Texas. And uh, just one thing I want to point out to you all and it's consistent with the UL uh, attic fire studies. Man, if the fire starts on the outside of these buildings or extends to the exterior combustible balconies, every speaker that I sat in on emphasizes you got to go for that exterior fire. It sounds good to get a hose line inside, but it's, it's not going to be effective against that fire that either originates or extends up the exterior, especially when you have combustible balconies and uh, vinyl sightings. So would anybody else like to relate some of their experiences from FDIC this year? I listened to a great Paul, speaker, I'm Justin, uh, uh, Sean Gray, Lieutenant Sean Gray out of Cobb County. He put on a presentation similar to that, one of the pre-conference, four-hour pre-conferences about hitting it hard for the exterior. And uh, he had a lot of great video of showing guys letting whole buildings burn to the ground because they're waiting to get hose lines in. And these hose lines are on the ground, and short hose lines are on the ground, and these crews are watching fire race up the exterior of these buildings, and they're just getting ready, putting their masks on, instead of putting a little water on the exterior. So it was a great class. So it is Sean Dre at a Clark County. Uh, Clark. Uh, and I know you're no stranger to those combustible exteriors. Uh, you have that uh, faux, uh, it looks like masonry. Uh, I call it gingerbread. And on the outside of buildings, it is all uh, styrofoam covered in a very thin layer of masonry. And we know what the uh, fire behavior and performance is. All you have to do is look at your Monte Carlo fire in that uh, hotel several years ago. Um, Clark, uh, Cobb County is classic for that, uh, and they've made their mistakes, but they admit their mistakes. Uh, when I was teaching there a few years ago, uh, one of their battalion chiefs, uh, Stoney Bowles, took me to a house uh, that was uh, uh, two stories in the front, would be three stories in the back that was built on a grade, heavy fire in a rear deck, uh, burning on the T-111 uh, wood siding, heavy fire condition, they took a hose line inside, I would have done the same thing, I would have done the same thing to protect the house, but the effect of that two and a half inch hose line on the rear fire involving the deck and the siding was minimal. Uh, consequently, the fire raced up the siding, got into the vents and the soffits, and took possession of the attic, and eventually they lost the structure. And they've learned from their experience. And that, I mean, that's the beautiful thing by going to FDIC, is that uh, you're, you're not only going to classes by people that can uh, talk the talk, but they've walked the walk. Anybody else want to give their experiences? Well, you know, Bill, what I'll add is, you know, there was a couple, there was a lot of great classes out there. I mean, and I really enjoyed uh, Frank Viscuso's uh, Step Up and Lead. Always does a fantastic job with that class. You know, the, the thing I love about it is that the, we know in the fire service, the greatest resource we have is our brain. You know, the greatest strength we have is our brain. And you get this one engine, you get both these all together. 
hear all these different views. I think what you really see here is that um, you know, we, we go here all these different ideas. The key is with disrespect and really spreading the ignorance of the fires. If we go to the common vision of this, what they want to say, that's exactly against what I believe. And really, you're the and I think every one of the classes, the classes are just doing job and job. And I have such a great spectrum of class class. But you can go to these classes, and I understand that almost Steve Holden said this during that speech, that every human has a passion for the opposite. They're looking to satisfy that curiosity. There are different things we believe in. What we want is those thinking firefighters. And that's what you really see at FDIC, thinking firefighters who are confused. Or what they believe, and, you know, I enjoy hearing someone has a direct contrast to what I believe. It agrees with them because, you know, at minimum, you're going to learn something. But if not, now you have a new opportunity to share some information and, and teach and learn. So that's what FDIC is all about. It really is some of the great facts of the of FDIC. It's really an opportunity. Not just some sort of social media blog that someone wrote that's 140 characters. Everyone gets angry and jumps. And now you can have a little deep little conversation. And you see that passion knows no tenure. The passion is, I got two years in the job. I had great talk on a couple of our dinners where he's kind of sharing his experiences and counsel on me over here. His experience as a battalion chief. For me, who's brand new to the So you, you get all this in one venue. venue. You can't find it It's fantastic. Dan, I want to give you a, a shameless plug. Uh, you will be down in our neck of the woods, down in uh, Florida. And uh, it's, we've got the heat and humidity waiting for you. Um, and I know you look so ridiculous when you put that sweat band or, uh, right above your eyebrows. But... Um, let me ask. I have a question for you. Will you be, will you be hosting a webcast, uh, nfdic.com, on your 25 to survive this year? This uh, year? we gladly will. We have not been approached about it yet, though. But uh, no, no, nothing on on the, the docket yet. Okay. We do the last one we did on the company operation. Glad to do it again. Right, and these are these are archived on uh, fireengineering.com, and uh, no. Believe me, there's no shortage. And another thing about FDIC is the variety is awesome. Just absolutely, you were talking about people from different backgrounds, different parts of the country. The variety is just absolutely awesome. The selection, there's no way. In fact, I've had a lot of folks come up and say, hey, I wish that they would offer the same class more than once. Because there's so many classes, you just can't attend any of them. But, uh, or everyone, I should say. But uh, the variety is absolutely awesome. You'll never see it anywhere else. Oh, uh, right. Jason, how are we doing there, my brother, from the heartland? Yeah, Mike, I did muted there. Yeah. Okay, Jason, you we're me? having yeah. trouble hearing you, Mike. Yep. Yep, I'm here, Bill. Okay, Mike. Uh, oh, I had a Mike, I want to. Uh, I want to talk just momentarily, and I know I've said this before, Mike, uh, you're representing the FB, FDNY, and I, I just have to say, as a member of the fire service, thank God for the FDNY, because your, your department, with all of its tradition and all of its pride, has not only embraced the research in fire dynamics, but you've spearheaded it with your, your uh, research at Governor's Island, and if a department your size can take a constructive, critical look at itself and say, hey, what we've been doing for the last 150 years may have been correct, but now giving what we know now in terms of fire dynamics, fuel loading, and um, uh, building construction, maybe we could do it a little bit better. Maybe we could do it a little bit safer. Well, you guys set the example. And if the FDNY is willing to take a look at how they do business, utilizing this new uh, th th this body of information, uh, then I think my department, everybody's department, needs to take a step back and also take a look at the way we're doing business. So, Mike, do you have any insight on some of the classes you attended at FDIC, sir? 
Well, I had a couple of uh, different classes that I went to. I went to one on the um, the launch uh, wood train building fires, and I found out some inter interesting information. And now building these wood rises, high rise wood building on the um, the uh, laminated wood, and they're up stories in email, but in our uh, brothers and sisters to the north in Canada, they're up to twelve stories. And this is just a building that amazes me, and I'm worried about the fire. I'm also worried about what happens if we have any kind of an earthquake, or how about the garbage truck at 5 in the morning get hit by a tree and takes a corner post out of this building on the first floor. What's going to happen to these buildings? And so I'm looking at this for information that I can bring back to uh, people I know and trust in the fire service. The other thing that I uh, I uh, led by my good friend Mike Galliano on go or no go, and I thought that was a very 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 interesting concept. People people to use their what they know. But use the visual cues to put that into uh, their idea of uh, what we're going or not going. And then just the exchange of information with brothers and sisters from all over the country is just amazing because you're learning from people who do it differently. Listen, I am a member of the FDM. As a matter of fact, I'm going to a dinner tonight to celebrate the 150th anniversary. But it's, it's an amazing thing to see. People who do things differently because of their resources, their staffing, their building types, and everything else. And learning from them. Because just because I do it one way, I do it another way, doesn't make my way right and your way wrong. And I like to say I learned at FBIC, I learned that you could have a lot of fun with some great people. Bobby Hall was a little stiff during the picture, but we had a lot of fun at FDIC. Yes, we do. Yeah. Uh, from the left, as you would see, it is uh, the good chief Mike Dugan, or the captain Mike Dugan. Can you hold it up again, Mike? Yep. Hold, there we go. Okay. Mike Dugan, myself, uh, my bald-headed brother, uh, Dan Shaw, uh, some guy that obviously does a lot of mirror time, uh, very well, that's Bobby Halton in the middle, and that's uh, uh, Jason Hovelman and uh, Clark Lamping. So we all got together. The only one we didn't have with us was Daryl uh, Liggins um, from Oakland. He was indeed at uh, uh, FDIC. We just we didn't get a chance to catch him. He's not today, with us today because he's uh, attending a Rescue Systems 2 class in uh, California. Very good, very good. Hey, I've now, got a question for the board. Yes, sir. Come on. Um, so I, I attended FDIC for the first time as a training officer. All right, I've always attended as a as a captain and as a firefighter, but now I'm a training officer. I took classes specific on how people learn. I took a great class from uh, uh, Chief Phil Josie out of Seattle, and uh, so I got all this information from FDIC. I bring it back to my department. And I'm having real trouble implementing this stuff. All the way from above me, the chiefs, the chiefs don't know if they want to buy in on the new technology. They don't know if they want to buy in on the new tactics. It's also below me. I'm trying to talk to the firefighters, and the firefighters don't know either. So my question for the old, older guys on the panel, who's been doing this for a long time, how do I go about making changes in my organization as the training officer with this new material that I acquired? Well, Clark, I can tell you it's not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. But I can tell you this. You are in a position where you can affect the greatest degree of change in your department, and that is in the training division. And it starts with recruits. It starts with changing their mindset, and then most of our uh, us are on departments that are hiring a lot of people, who are having a lot of people retiring. And before you know it, those recruits, 10 years now, they're company officers. So it may take 10 years, but you will affect changes. You know, you come back from FDIC all pumped up, all enthusiastic. And then 
it's a little bit of a letdown when you come back and, and people that did, did not go that don't have an appreciation for FDIC. Not really interested in what you have to say. Uh, but I, I find that's becoming less and less all the time. Um, you know, we could talk about Generation Xers and Millennials, and we could, what, what about you know kids today are just they don't have the character. Well, you know, I have I'm I'm a, I'm a father of a 25 year old girl and a 30 year old son, and those young people are better than I was at that age. And I've got young. We just graduated a recruit class, and you talk about affecting change because we have some top notch. Uh, recruit training instructors that want to be there and they are shaping this department at its foundation which is its recruit classes so Clark please don't get discouraged I don't have an easy answer for you but you are in the right place at the right time to affect change in your department well I think Bill I mean to, to what Clark's point is what I've always found it always kind of seems to work is when someone wants to implement a new idea or a new system and they get a lot of opposition People typically never lie when they write something down. So it's always good to go back to that person who has a contrary view of what you believe and say, hey, give me a favor, just write down what you don't like about what I'm presenting and so I can understand. And what you'll find is you really get the, the, the core of it because you have to write down something. So they'll probably read it before they hand it to you. And if they read it and say, wow, well, that really is short sighted, or if you're really passionate about why they, they don't want to do what you're suggesting, then you can get this information right in front of you to get to the, to the core of the issue and not just chase the smoke per se. You're actually looking right at the core of the issue say, okay, I thought you didn't like this idea because of this, but now I see this is why you don't like it. And what you see is a lot of it is just ignorance as to what exactly you presented. Whether they didn't listen to the full scope of the idea, or maybe you didn't present it in the right, in the best manner to reach that. Much like what Bill was talking about is that generationally we all learn differently. And, and going back to intellectual curiosity, everyone has it. It's a, that, that's the challenge for the training officer, the company officer, is to figure out how do you reach each one of those generations that sit at that kitchen table with you and all learn differently. But you have to present the same material and get the buy-in from each one of those. And I've always found that's always really beneficial. Like my mother always told me, you have two ears and one mouth, so listen twice as much as you talk. You might actually hear what the issue is and, and be able to figure it out and then get your idea through there. You've got to in the fire department, everything is not compromised. So a little give and take to get your idea out there and figure out how can I take this system that I learned or heard about and then implement it in my department. And some of those things might not work out because you don't have the facilities or logistics to do it, but you know, there's parts of it, the core of the issue, we can get implemented because you know I got the people who want to do it. Uh, so I mean I think that has always been beneficial for me is when you get that opposition and say, hey, write it down so I can figure out what exactly is your opposing view. And then I can start working on each part of that. Or maybe I might discover you're right. But maybe this is too, too much, too grand for our department, or it's just not feasible. Just a thought. Uh, another thing the bigger the department, the more difficult and the more time consuming it is to affect change. Uh, you're sm I, I can see it on the departments in my area. Uh, something new comes out, a new piece of equipment, a new procedure. They are way ahead of us in implementing these changes. You know, when you get a department that's got uh, 2,500 people uh, out in the field, it's difficult. You know, it takes an act of Congress to get things to to change, uh, and it's usually the training division that's tasked with teaching people new techniques and new uh, 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 tools and new new equipment. Uh, and they they've got a double whammy because uh, they've got the burden of recruit training because of uh, we're we're hiring and we have a turnover, a lot of people retiring right now. In fact, a lot of people tell me I should retire, but I'm not, <laughs> at least not today, uh, maybe tomorrow. But uh, they also, so they're charged with recruit training, but they're also charged with in-service training and then special training for um, uh, new equipment. Oh, and one other thing, the mandated training. All of the things that are required by OSHA and, and uh, the federal government for, you know, your bloodborne pathogens and all that, uh, it's no easy task. So the bigger the department, the more difficult and the more time consuming it is to implement changes. Jason, are you there? Can you hear us? Jason, hold on. Can you hear me? 
Can yes, you I can, you're a little blurry, but that's fine, as long as we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, Clark, I just give you an example. When we did our training division, we ran into the same issues, and what we finally decided that we had to do was really prioritize what we wanted to try and change. And so broke it down. It happened. So we had to change the change mode or something. We would do training with uh, appointment. And we say, hey, let's change those mode. The more guys would come across, had it here and there, uh, on, on their own. But for the thing, we prioritize that one at a time and uh, see if we can benefit from it. Okay, we're kind of losing you there, Jason. Um, Bobby, any thoughts on that? I think <clears throat> it's a very uh, common um, comment that we hear from training officers regarding new training or even sometimes recurring training in general. It's a interesting to say the least, phenomena uh, that we don't fully appreciate the risks that we face sometimes as an industry, as a group. <clears throat> I think that the heightened awareness that you get when you're at some place like FDIC, as Bill said and, and, and uh, Clark said much better than I ever could, of how much we don't know uh, I'm amazed every day as I sit here and review the magazine at, at how little, even after 40 years, I know about this incredible industry that we're all involved in. To that point, yesterday we had a Google Hangout where we had a discussion about training, and uh, we had just filmed some uh, training on a, a railway prop, and I commented on how common a problem that is in the fire service, yet how little really in-depth training or education we receive in, in that particular uh, realm. And then tragically yesterday afternoon we have the uh, Philadelphia derailment and six people lost their lives and 200 injured. Well, to that point, absent that particular event, I'm sure that if the training chief, and I'm just going to say East-West Philadelphia, because I'm sure that doesn't exist, hopefully, came back came from back the IC and said, we need to do more training on rail. Somebody in that organization, if not two or three, um, I think it Castro calls them lounge chair snipers or something, would have had a problem with it. The, the problem that we're seeing, I think, generally, uh, in society is that the Complainers tend to get a whole lot more attention than the folks who say, hey, that's a great idea, let's go train. And, and it's the same way with evaluation. If you give a class, 500 guys who say, oh, that was super, and, and one person says, oh, you stink. Uh, there was a great story. Um, the guy from um, uh, Larry David, famous comedian, was at Yankee Stadium. They put the camera on him, 50,000 people jumped up and said, yay, we love Larry David. And then one guy even one guy yells at him in the parking lot, hey, David, you stink or something. What did he obsess with? Not, not the 50,000 who loved him, but the one guy who gave him the time. So sometimes, just in human nature, we, we tend to hear the negative people more than we hear the positive people. And it, it happens to all of us, me, everybody. Clark, I think Clark, you're talking to me now. I would just I keep would going ahead with a smile on my face and, and realize 95% of the folks in that organization appreciate what you're doing, are happy to learn, want the new knowledge, want to do the training. And those 5% of the folks that have that cloud over their head, you know, there's no lack of thing. May those may who love us, love us, and may those who don't, may God change their heart, to, to turn their hearts. And if you can't turn their hearts, turn their anchor. You will know them by their anchor. <laughs> Folks, if I could uh, just remind everybody, uh, we are sponsored by Keyhose. Uh, you can uh, get information on Keyhose, which is manufactured in Dothan, Alabama. That would be L.A., Lower Alabama, at keyfire.com. Uh, it's an easy endorsement for me, again, because I uh, 
I use it on my company. It's widely used throughout my department. And I really don't think you're going to find a hose that has a better uh, balance of durability, flow capability, kink resistance, abrasion, and heat resistance. So uh, it's, it's a good product. I heartily endorse it, and I thank them for sponsoring this. If I could just interject something about recruit training. So I'm teaching these recruits last week, and um, I said, now listen, show them all the tests on uh, um, transitional fire attack. And there's a way to apply an exterior stream and a way not to apply an exterior stream. And I said, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not, on your own, apply an exterior stream. Make sure you have a direct order from your, a, a, your company officer. However, if you are given an order and the company officer does not specify the technique of applying the exterior stream, this is what you do. Use a straight stream or a solid tip nozzle and we have the this, we, we have the prerogative to have either on our apparatus depending upon the, the, the captain of the company apply the straight stream or a solid stream down at the bottom of the window directing it upwards and impinge that stream off the underside of the ceiling don't vigorously apply it don't use a fog pattern allow the bottom of the window to continue to be the intake and for the top of the window to continue to be the exhaust if the door to that room is closed so I gave them the tools but I gave them the caveat hey don't do this because it's not generally or culturally accepted on my fire department but ten years from now it will be and they will be comfortable with it and ready to implement it, but not right today. And don't you think, Bill, that that whole thing starts with the training, with the young men and women in our training division? Because now the brothers and sisters out in the field see this kid do something, and it might be as simple as wearing their mask during overall. I remember when people used to say, no, don't wear your mask. You've got to learn how to eat some smoke, okay? And so take it off during overall. And how many brothers and sisters are now have cancer throughout their bodies? How many of us have passed away? And then we see the young kids saying, no, 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 those are my lungs. You know, I'm taking care of my lungs. And that's what they were taught at the training academy. And then other people looked at them and they got, you know, their eyes are tearing and they're snotting up and they're coughing. And they're like, who's the stupid one here? And I think a lot of it starts with your recruits. And it also starts if you have a class for your newly promoted officers where you're bringing them up to speed on what's going on. Now they're going into the field and they affect the children in the firehouses and the apparatus floors and more importantly on the fireground. And I think that's a very, very, very important thing that we give them the tools, as you said, transitional attack. We give them the tools, make them thinking firefighters. Mike, um, I am so grateful to our training division because uh, I'm looking at this from a, uh, a training officer standpoint, which I occasionally am called in to train uh, recruits. But you know that you're the, the most important training officer in the department is the company officer. I'm so grateful to our training division. Within the last, I know when I came on, uh, the training, the people in training were newly promoted and did not want to be there. Uh, they were not the best people for the job. And as a result, the product, that is the recruit that was coming out into the field, was weak. They were weak. So you got somebody that you had to train as a company officer. You had to almost like put them through your own academy. That is not the case within the last 10 years on my job. These young people that are coming out in terms of, they, I know they don't have the experience, but the skill level is incredible. And that is a tribute to the fine people that we have in our training division. God bless them. Because frankly, I'm tired of being a recruit training instructor. I've got enough responsibility as a company officer and trying to run basic drills over and over and over again for a recruit is very difficult because of our uh, our call volume. So God bless these guys in training. I hope some of the guys in our training and girls and girls are watching this right now because I'm sincerely grateful to you for what you're doing and the product that you're producing in terms of the quality of our fire recruits. I remember, Bill, when I was a young fireman, we used to go to the uh, fire academy in New York City. It's called The Rock, Randall's Island. And they used to tell you when you were going. And you had to go take a test. 
and you had to take a test on what we were supposed to be drilling on for that month. And so all the senior guys, if you take the junior guy who's the newest out of the academy, you know, what's the answer for question one? What's the answer for question two? And if you did well, if you're on the department orders, if you did bad, and went to the division of Italian, and it, was, it was a written test. It was an ABC. It was a silly thing. Now we go into the academy, and they give you fire scenarios, down fireman scenarios. They give you things to make you think about communication, your job, what you're supposed to be doing, and everything else. And it's so nice that it's so different. And they're training you on newer things, and I think that's perfect. And it's also a lot of the stuff back, like being an FDIC. We had a guy who put together a, um, a radio program, the FDNY, on the capabilities of the radio, how it works, uh, why sometimes communications are not going through. This guy spent a year putting this program together and doing all of these tests. And it's amazing what the brothers and sisters learned on that. And he picked up these ideas from seeing people talk about radio malfunctions at FDIC a couple of years ago. And I think the whole thing with any of this is our training divisions, FDIC and everything else, is getting the knowledge of what works and what doesn't work, why it works in Miami, why it works in New York, why it doesn't work in Houston, Texas, or why it doesn't work in Sacramento, California. doesn't matter, but finding out what the parameters are and what makes that a good thing, and I think that's so important to us as veteran fire officers is continuing to learn. Well, I, I couldn't agree more, and it's it's um, it's inspiring uh, to see what uh, you know what you can bring back from FDIC. Uh, again, it's I like to tell the recruits, and and when I do the officer development class for my own department in in, um, in Palm Beach County, you don't want to go to every fire, bro. You don't want to go to every fire. My dad used to tell me that. Bill, com quit complaining about not getting enough fires. Be careful what you wish for because your wishes may come true and you'll find yourself going to fires that you wish you never went to because sooner or later somebody's going to get hurt. What we want to do is learn from fires that we were lucky enough not to go to. And But when you go to FDIC, again, you're talking to people or you're learning from people that not only can walk the walk or talk the talk, they walk the walk. So you're learning uh, this fellow from Omaha, Nebraska. They've had some spectacular fires in these wood frame monsters. I don't want to go to a fire where uh, I almost lose somebody in one of these monsters. I would much rather sit in an air-conditioned, comfortable classroom and listen, learn from the experience of somebody that went through this and has uh, adjusted their tactics and strategy. So I don't have to repeat the same mistakes uh, or the same lessons learned. Uh, and, and I give this guy a lot of credit because they have changed the way they do business in Omaha, and God bless this guy for his class. And they just have had, a, as, as we've seen around the country, I mean, since we've talked about this subject, I mean, there's been a rash of these wood frame monster fires. Uh, but it gives us a chance when we go to FDIC to, to learn from other people's experiences. You don't have to experience it yourself. Thank God you don't have to. Jason, are you are you back with us, my brother? I'll try I'll one try. more time. I'm on wireless. Oh, no, you sound great. All right, good All right. deal. Yeah, yeah no, uh, no, just no, picking up where you're talking about FDIC. FDIC. One of the greatest FDIC. things too is not only sitting in the classes, but having access, access to instructors, instructors to ask very ask specific questions, questions or, or gain those answers or that or maybe they get covered in the classroom, classroom, or you've got or a similar situation, situation that you want advice or suggestions on, and. That contact is valuable. You can't get it anywhere else. And anybody, basically anybody that's there that week, you've got a 30,000 people to network with and to share experiences to take back with you along with the classes. Yeah, and there's something else. Uh, there's, some of the learning takes place after the classes. Um, the other reason you come back from FDIC uplifted, uh, you, you tend to find out that some of the problems and the trials and tribulations that you have uh, on your department, and you find out, you start talking to fellas and girls around the country, they have the same problems. 
So, you know, you find out, you know, maybe things aren't as bad on your department as you thought they were. You know, it's... Um, different clouds. Exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's just another thing. And for those of you, and I've mentioned this before, hey, the nightlife is great. If you're planning, if it's next year, if you decide to go to FDIC, have a great time. And believe me, I like to party it up and socialize with my brothers and sisters after hours at, at FDIC when I'm not attending classes. But please don't let the nightlife diminish your ability to get up in the morning and go to the opening ceremonies and attend classes okay all day. Right? That's not why you're there. That's secondary. And that's part that's a big part of it. But don't imbibe and uh, frivolity to the point that it interferes with you going to the classes because I see this happen to young people um, and it's it's really sad and it's a waste so you know exercise a little bit of judgment have a good time but exercise a little bit of judgment and don't forget why you're there primarily you're there to attend classes right Mr. Lamb and you who wants to who would like to miss the opening ceremonies Bobby Halton and the keynoters, whoever they are, giving their perspective on the fire service. It's just an amazing, amazing morning. You sit there, if you're not recharged by the energy in that room with five or 6,000 like-minded brothers and sisters, you're missing something. You, you, something's wrong with you. Because that is just an amazing, amazing, you know, uh, Wednesday and Thursday mornings at FDIC is just an amazing thing with the opening ceremony and see what's going on and listening, you know, watching the colors be presented. It's amazing. It, it, it uplifts you because you find that you're a small cog in a much greater thing, a much greater machine. Let's look at another aspect of FDIC we haven't talked about yet, and that is the showroom floor, the exhibition floor, which is just absolutely awesome. It's a Disneyland for firefighters, uh, but it's also an opportunity for, for you to find out what is out there in the industry and to actually put your hands on this. Uh, what I'd like to do is kind of go through uh, with, with all of you, and uh, I'll start with myself. And some of the things that uh, we see in terms of uh, protective clothing, uh, fire apparatus, uh, new developments in uh, uh, suppression equipment, appliances. Uh, I'm impressed with the pump mock-ups, the cutaways of the pumps. I know my own department um, is um, as an FDNY, a 9-11 um, commemorative memorial engine our apparatus are all lime green don't ask me why but they are except one and that's engine three I think Mike I think you saw this apparatus uh, and it has very it's incredible 343 names on uh, the black stripe along the side of the apparatus so kudos for Rosenbauer uh, for that but as you look around the um, the apparatus floor and the equipment floor it really gives you an idea of what's out there and you may have a problem that um, you see a piece of equipment that you may be able to solve uh, just by looking at the ex exhibition floor so it's certainly nothing uh, that's something you don't want to miss uh, anybody want to relate some of their experiences or something they learned or were impressed with on the uh, exhibition floor I know for me, Bill, um, I obviously be in a new position. I've only been chief for just uh, a short of two months. And I, I, I was walking for seeing kind of the new innovation we have and, and uh, different tools and things of that nature, which is always interesting to see. I, mean, I think you can very quickly connect what's kind of gimmicky, and then you see some things that really kind of streamline to make your job a little easier in the command function. And I look at it also for. Uh, some of the company officers I might have to call because I'm maybe delayed because of traffic. Travel. I have to have them take them in. And other tools out to make their job easier when they get to all the enrichment tactical or strategic level. Um, so it's kind of interesting that. And additionally, I was fortunate enough to do some stuff with Acre and see what they have. And yeah, it's always good to see those companies run Acre and are always working to, to develop new tools and to make us more efficient in the fire ground. 
and by far another one of the things I think we discount a lot of, but yeah, it's the most important tool we have in our hands uh, to put out fire. You take it into the most dangerous room, and then you rely upon it flawlessly in this environment. It hangs out the side of the apparatus, gets thrown around all over the place, gets covered in road grit and grime. So it's, it's always good to see that you know, those, those uh, industries are working to go. Very good tools for us to use, and the new innovations are out there. I'll let people tell, ask me, well, hey, Cap, have you ever seen this? Yeah, I saw it 10 years ago at FDIC, for instance. And it's going to take some, not completely comfortable with it yet, but I can see it coming. It's been in Germany for years. And this is that curtain that we hang in the doorway that controls the, uh, the flow path of air going into a fire as we're advancing a hose line. And if you uh, attended any of the classes by Chief Alconis from L.A. County, you know they're at the forefront of controlling this this doorway. Well, we also had we also had Mike Reich from Germany who gave a whole class. Excellent. Yes, Chief uh, Halton, we have uh, a lot of visitors um, to our department, and the Germans are they're very interesting. They're really into the job, and they're really into uh, equipment and gadgets. And in in a sense, they're uh, they're ahead of us in 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 several ways, uh, but this, this, this curtain you were mentioning, the fellow from Germany, yes, that is where this originated from, with, and um, I, I think that, uh, our, and I showed it to our recruits, and I said, hey, maybe not in my time, because I'm about ready to retire, but in your career, you will be using this device on our department. I'm almost 100% certain of that. Yeah, we did a, we had a great article online about, uh, Six eight months ago, by Frank Ritchie and 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 uh, 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 B.J. Norwood, about some studies they did up there in uh, New Haven using curtains, and, and we've had Mike Reich in two years in a row now uh, talking about uh, you know we talk about fires and controlling the uh, you know the the, the the airflow into the building. We used to have a door control person. This curtain is a really Neat option, Neat option. and uh, I think we're. Uh, I agree with you, Mike, I, 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 brother Bill. I think that this is going to be a uh, huge, huge tool going forward. I think that we're going to see, you know, it used more frequently. It's kind of a tool in the toolbox. It's not the kind of CS. I think one of the things I saw at FDIC to kind of dovetail what I was talking about here is that I got back notes, folks, and it was. A lot of folks really enjoy the give and take, as, as Mike was talking about earlier, about things that work here and work there, and, and they're very open-minded. And then some other folks come back with almost a single-minded focus, um, almost a jihadist uh, obsession with whatever they picked up on is now the silver bullet that's going to save everything, which was kind of interesting. There's a few of those. And then I thought, well, wow, it's kind of interesting take coming back from a show that prides itself in the first of opinion. Yeah, um, this is just a little teaser because I really think we can spend a whole um, uh, session on this. Uh, I taught a class to Palm Beach County last week, and I showed the difference between, if I could, I'm going to hold this up to the camera. Okay, this traditional time temperature curve which has been used, I believe it's ASTM E84, it's been used by underwriters laboratories for almost a hundred years, uh, and that's how they test fire resistive assemblies in their furnace. Uh, that's not representative of what we're seeing in uh, today's fires because of petrochemical based materials that burn with a, uh, an affinity, a uh, ferocious acti uh, appetite for oxygen, and um, uh, the closed up energy efficient closed up structures that are in a sense, almost airtight. This is uh, the curve that's been developed by NIST and UL. And as you can see, uh, you may have, holding this up correctly, yes, uh, you may have actually have flashover. But as the oxygen is consumed in a building, uh, the fire intensity diminishes. When you make an opening, then the fire re-intensifies because it's in a ventilation controlled or ventilation limited phase. Now, how fast 
is that fire going to re-intensify when you make an opening? Well, that varies with a lot of variables, a lot of variables. I had a student in Palm Beach County write this curve. Do you see where it says varies? You see where you have that horizontal line? That is because in tests, it can take anywhere from 100 to 200 seconds for enough air to flow in through the opening where you're advancing your hose line for that air to find the unburned combustible fire gases, uh, mix in a proper proportion, and reflash. And it begs the question, when you're going into a large building where you can't locate the fire, what's going to reach the fire first? You with the nozzle? or the oxygen that's flowing in behind you with uh, as you open up that door. Now some of the variables we can control, like this curtain, like door control, like cooling the fire gases as we're advancing. Yes, we can control those. We can't control the wind. We may not be able to control uh, the amount of openings. Again, it's just a scratch on the surface, but I have been really excited about this. I've been collaborating with some fine people in the fire service. Uh, the important point is know what the variables are because it may be a rapid intensification of a fire if the fire happens to be right at the air intake. It may take 200 seconds if the fire is on the second floor in the back of the building. The point is it's, it's almost like what you were talking about, Bobby. You know, this ex extreme narrow focus is that know what we can control and know what we can't control and know what the variables are. And, again, I want to spend a whole session on this and uh, because it's just scratched the surface. But this has – it's been exciting for me to collaborate with uh, – well, I'm, I'm going to drop a few names. Uh, Dave Walsh from uh, Dutchess Community College in um, – Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, I, I ran this by Steve Kerber, um, and it's it's something that um, it's not perfect, not by any means. It's not by any means. And I, they don't. I'm not saying that it's being being endorsed by anybody right now. It's a work in progress. But guys, I think this is something that we have to communicate to our people because there are variables, and the key is know what the variables are, what we can control, and what we cannot control. Well, you know, not not to I don't I don't mean to take up too much time, but one of the things that came back, a young man wrote back to me and he said, obviously based on what he learned at FDIC by listening to some of the lectures on, on the science side, was that we shouldn't do vertical ventilation anymore. And he cited Steve and Dan. Well, that's not what Steve and Dan said at all. What Steve and Dan said is that there's still benefits to doing vertical ventilation. You just need to coordinate your fire attack. And then, uh, more effectively with it when you utilize the ventilation technique due to the heat release rates that Bill just so eloquently discussed. So, but he heard what he wanted to hear, which, which I thought was fascinating. Bobby, how many people come up to you and say, don't spray water on uh, heat, uh, steel that's been exposed to heat. Don't spray water on heat. It'll break or it'll collapse. Well, that has to do with prefabricated cast, prefabricated cast iron cast iron but somebody hears that and it shuts off to anything else and to this day you still hear people taught saying don't spray water on heat uh, steel that's been exposed to heat because they, they it, hear what they want to hear and they shut it off it reminds me of when I was a little kid I'd come home with my report card and I got an A in gym and I got probably C's and D's and everything else, but I'd say, but I got an A, I got an A, I got an A, okay? The only thing I can say, I got one A. I didn't care about anything else. I got an A. My father cared about everything else. And then I ended up having to go to summer school because he wouldn't allow me to do less than a, uh, a C in any class. But it's the same thing in the fire service. They read a report or they read an article and they take one piece of the information. And that is now the gospel. Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson once said the, the most dangerous man in the world is the man who's read one book. Mm. And that's true. That's true. Now, brothers, we have got to remain open-minded. And, and 
I know that we are all like-minded and we are open-minded. Uh, and, and this is why, and I'm getting back to the purpose of our today's uh, hangout. We're all veterans uh, in this job, in our profession. Uh, we're all instructors. Uh, we're all writers. But we're all open-minded, and we're still, the bottom line is, we are lifelong students of the fire service, and our need to learn these new concepts and be receptive to them are just as great as the day we started this profession, and there's no better place in the world to learn them, and that is at FDIC. And don't get discouraged. If you can't go to FDIC, remember, you can go to FDIC.com. There's two uh, webcasts per month, 2 o'clock Central, 3 o'clock Eastern, and you can glean a lot of material right from that. So it's not just for the guys that can go or the girls that can go, but uh, it's and it's not just that it happens uh, one week in April every year. It's happening throughout the year through these archived webcasts. It looks like we're about ready to wrap things up. And well, um, Mike, go ahead, sir. I want to say again to everybody, thank you for being there. And I also want to say, uh, when I was growing up, I wasn't a great student, and my father pushed me very hard. And one of my father's favorite, favorite lines was, readers are leaders. Look at the magazine. Look at what's on the blogs. Read what's out there. Form your opinion by looking at other things, looking at both sides of every issue, and then form your opinions. And always, always, always question what people say. And, and you know, why? Why am I doing this in the fire service? Why am I doing that? Because if we don't have an answer for it, we got to go back and find out why we are doing something. And keep being a student. Great, Mike. I can't agree more. Jason, any closing comments? No, nah, just the one, one thing is if you do go to FDIC, bring it back and share it with everybody, that the ones that can't make it. Dan? Yeah, you know, and, and this is a, a topic I am very passionate about, and you're exactly right. I always like a quote by uh, Daniel Gorstein that uh, the greatest uh, optional great knowledge is not ignorance, the illusion of knowledge. Uh, and, and, and every day we have to build that knowledge base. And, and like Mike just said, is that you know, some of the greatest advances in society are because someone questioned science. Science opened the door, and you know, all the variables were open the door. Think about all the medical advances that happened with medicine and everything else. Someone questioned the initial idea and opened it up to seeing how vast they can apply that to it. Really, we got to the solution of it. But it all comes back to people applying, I think, between your two ears to what we're talking about. And you know, questioning and figuring out what works for you and always having that, you know, we can call it a 2,000 year mind because we intend that 5,000 year mind. In fact, that there's 5,000 documented warfare in books. So every day we should be in the books reading about past success and failures. Now if we have 2,000 years of firefighting. We should be reading everything from the days of the Romans up to now. I mean, what we can glean from that and apply to the modern day fire environment, firefighters we have, because much like Bill, you've been doing and Mike's done, and what he's done is you're creating a legacy that you want to leave that we have thinking firefighters who continue this, this fantastic trend that you see at FDIC where everyone's sharing information. And you see 30,000 of the most famous firefighters out there. Uh, very, very well put. Clark, any closing comments, sir? Uh, yes, just real quickly. Um, we were talking about the showroom floor at FDIC. Um, I stopped by the NIST booth, NIST booth, and they had a whole table full of all of their DVDs, all their CDs of all the research that they have ever done, giving it all away. Giving it away. They have cases and cases of these DVDs, and they're fantastic information, and that was so important. I got everything, quality videos, all of the research, and if you guys didn't have a chance to attend FTIC, you can contact this yourself, and they will send everything they've ever done for 
free. And I highly recommend videos. Any training officers out there in the audience, you need some kind of proof about the new technology working. It's already been done. You do not have to reinvent the wheel. This technology is out there. The videos are out there. It's tough to argue with these videos and the research these folks have come up with. So that's all I have. Clark, uh, oh, that that is great, and you know, it's uh, that that needs to be passed on. You hit a home run with that closing comment, uh, boss. Anything for for a closing comment? Well, I, I just got to laugh because we're talking about technology, and this of all people is still making DVDs. Really? I'm just <laughs> you can't even buy a computer with a DVD player in it anymore. But uh, which is kind of interesting when you think about the speed of technology and how much more knowledge we have out there. And, and although we have that knowledge. We still need a thing like FDI that we can go face to face, look in the eyes of one another, and share because the real human to human experience is just there's no way to put a way to put a, a, a value to it in calculus. But to that point, the COVID presentation is open. If you want to FDIC 2016, now's the time to get the paperwork in. We'd love to see your stuff. Go to FDIC.com or FireInfire.com. Get online today. And be part of the solution. Again, I want to thank uh, Keyhose at Keyfire.com uh, for their uh, sponsoring of our webcast. On a personal note, uh, it brings me great joy and pride to be able to participate with you wonderful guys and to be able to share our thoughts uh, and philosophies with the rest of our brothers and sisters in the fire service. And uh, we care what you what you what you're thinking. Um, we try to address issues that uh, are of concern to uh, the greater number of people in the fire service. And until next month, I want to wish all our brothers and sisters uh, not only safety and to stay safe, but it's more than staying safe. It's staying healthy. Okay, that's physically and mentally. Take care of yourselves. God bless you, and we'll be talking to you next month.